probably the better room for you still. Um, um, you might learn something, but this will definitely be skewed towards people who have a little bit of programming background, right? So I'm assuming that you probably, you know, hopefully all of you are familiar at least with things like for loops, data types, etc. Um, but maybe you don't know much about Python and you're coming from R or MATLAB and you just want to get a feel for the Python language. And so this will be sort of a brief introduction that kind of walks you through what Python is, where it sits in the sort of broader ecosystem of programming languages, why you might want to use Python, and then how things are done in Python, and what are the sort of the common data science packages people use. Um, any questions before I start? People, any, any questions about orientation, like should I be in this room or that room? There's like a lot of people. Like oh, are there? Okay. Can we remove mm -hmm. from a different place? Sorry? Can we download them? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So yeah, if, if, if this doesn't work for you, um, then you can go to, uh, the course uh, github so github.com slash neuroacademy and uh, it's under introduction to python and if you don't want to like run it interactively then you can always just uh, click on this and it'll render in the browser so you can just read along uh, but i would recommend having it so that you can actually execute cells and because and, because a lot of this will in fact a lot of the cells are empty and we're going to live code as we go through so i think it's, it's definitely will be more helpful if you can get it running in jupyter lab or locally so that you can go through as we're we're going in real time. Um, okay, we said we're going to start at 2.40, so people can wander in uh, as, as they finish. Um, how many people here, just, just to give me a sense of like how fast I should go, how many people have, like, would describe themselves as having like, zero experience in Python functionally? Okay, so a few. Uh, how many people have sort of dabbled in Python but don't really, wouldn't describe themselves as sort of like, you know, you would say you're a sort of novice pro, uh, Python. Okay, good. So, all right, so, so most of the people in the room, I think, are, you know, uh, uh, in, the, in the right room. And if you're not, you can take a little nap and uh, answer your email. Uh, Rogers, I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, okay, so um, what is Python? Well, it's a programming language, right? We know that. It's hopefully why you're all here. Um, and if we want to be more specific, we could say that it's a widely used very flexible, high-level, general-purpose, dynamic programming language. So that's quite a mouthful. Uh, and what we can do is we can just take that big statement and break it up into the chunks. And I think that's a helpful way to understand where Python sits in the sort of broader ecosystem of programming languages. Uh, and feel free to, to interrupt at any point and ask questions, by the way. Um, um, so widely used, um, Python is at this point, I think by almost any, any accounting, uh, well, it's, it's, it, most people would, would I think, most indexes will, will, would say that it's the fastest growing major programming language and has been for, quite, for a few years. It's probably in the top three overall languages uh, along with JavaScript and Java. And this depends on how you count, right? Because it's hard to actually estimate what people are using. So like here's one, uh, one estimate that comes from Stack Overflow and it's based on like what people are searching for. And you can see that the, the Python just, just skyrocketed in popularity over the last few years. Um, so this is, you know, starts in 2012 when it was way behind uh, languages like uh, Java and JavaScript in pop popularity. And now more people are searching for Python than, than pretty much any other language. And these are the most common languages, but if you look at the sort of the next group after that, you see sort of the same thing. There's sort of um, uh, really rapid growth to Python. There are some other interesting things just as an aside in this figure, you'll notice that Java has this very cyclical weird pattern. Any guesses to why that is? Like why are people? Yeah, right, so, so lots of computer science departments still teach programming in Java, and so most likely that's what's happening, right? You see it's like yeah, fall semester and spring exactly, people are freaking out and searching for Java. And my, my, my hypothesis is that the reason you see this like bump in the summer is because all those CS majors are going to do internships and they're writing web pages and they're like, oh no, I don't know anything about JavaScript. Just speculating. You don't see that kind of pattern for Python, right? Which, which suggests that people who use Python use it year round because it's a great language. That's my conclusion from that. But just, I just want to give you a sense that, you know, like Python is not, I don't want you to think like you're coming to this course, how these people happen to like Python, so of course they're going to talk about it. There are good reasons to, to, to like Python and to use Python because lots of people are using Python. And that, that provides, I think, a very healthy, uh, large, vibrant community from which you can build off as a base. So it's a widely used language. It's high level. What does that mean? Uh, it means it has a high level of abstraction. Right? So if you think of computer uh, programming languages, some of you probably learned programming in Java, C, C++. And um, if you've dabbled in Python, and you'll see this here, 
Python code is much more abstract, meaning there's lots of operations that you have to make explicit in other languages, in lower level languages like C, C++, that are implicit in Python. So if you've ever, for example, had to initialize a variable in, in C, right, you have to decide ahead of time how much memory you're going to allocate. Um, that's the kind of thing you don't really think about in Python. In fact, I'm not even sure if you can think about that even if you wanted to. Right? You, you don't, all that stuff is invisible. It's happening in the background still, but the Python interpreter is handling that for you. And that, as we'll see, will come at a little bit of a cost. But the idea is that um, lots of stuff that lower level languages force you to do yourself, languages like Python, actually for that matter R, Ruby, uh, languages in that class will do for you. So you have in some sense a much nicer development experience because you don't have to think about all of these kind of features. You can write code faster, and that's, that's important. So just this is sort of a classic example. It's a little unfair, but canonically this is how you read a file uh, into memory in Java, right? You have all this, there are other ways to do it too, so this is cheating a little bit, but you, you might see this, something like this in production code in Java, right? This is like just to read a file. Um, as I mentioned, there are quicker ways to do it, but this is the canonical way in Python. Right? You just open the file and you read. Now, Python, again, is doing all the stuff you just saw. It's creating a buffer, right? it's grabbing blocks from the file and reading them into that buffer and so on, but it's doing it for you. If you really want to, you can, you can access all that stuff yourself. You can write it more verbosely, but you don't have to by default. Um, Python is general purpose. You can do almost everything in Python, which turns out to be a really nice feature for a programming language to have. It has a really comprehensive standard library. Well, talk about that in a bit, meaning out of the box what you get with Python uh, is lots and lots of functionality that in many other languages you would have to sort of go out into the world and see, well, what tools are there that, that can do this? Often you don't even have to look for third-party packages. What's in the library, the standard libraries, is quite impressive. And, but beyond that, there's an enormous uh, ecosystem of third-party packages, just, just massive um, you know, tens and I think over 100,000 packages contributed by other people. Uh, it's widely used in many, many areas of software. So um, I tend to think of it, many people do, as sort of a dot data science language, but there's entire communities who don't care at all about data science, or very little, like DevOps, and, uh, and you know, just for the web, backends. And you can do lots and lots of stuff in Python uh, that you can't necessarily do in other languages that are sort of heavily focused on things like data science. For example, R, right? So R is great, but there's not that much you can do very easily once you get outside of, sort of the, the domain of data analysis. Um, Python is a dynamic language. Uh, what does that mean? Well, dynamic is sort of a, an odd word. There's many definitions of what a dynamic programming language is. It's not a well-defined term. But you can think of this as, as, as implying that the code is interpreted at runtime, meaning you're not, you don't write some code and then have to sit through a compilation process. It's not entirely true. You can actually compile chunks of Python code. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later. But the general idea is that code is read line by line when it's executed. Right? And, you, and you, you, again, if you've had some programming experience with something like uh, C, or or Java, you'll know that you have to wait maybe a few seconds, but sometimes it's longer. Every time you make a change or you need to recompile your code to run it, it does not happen in Python. You're done, you run the thing, and it starts going line by line. Um, so this eliminates the delay between development and execution, which is nice. Cycle can be much faster. There is a downside. There's a couple of downsides. Um, one of which is that it doesn't, it's harder to catch certain kinds of bugs. And the other downside is that you typically get poor performance compared to compiled languages, right? So what you get in part from that compilation process is some degree of optimization, where the compiler is figuring out sort of a, how to take shortcuts to do what you're trying to do more efficiently than just the code as you've written it would, would seem to suggest. Um, so there's a cost, but by and large, development time is really what's, what we care about generally, especially in this community, right? It doesn't really matter so much if it takes another five minutes to run a piece of code if you save yourself three days uh, of debugging. Um, so that's just a very quick overview of where Python sits within the, the ecosystem of programming languages. Any questions? And I'll, I'll do a little bit of a comparison between Python and other languages in a bit with respect to data science. But if there are any questions about anything I just said, um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about what the language looks like. So we'll start with variables and data types. Um, so in Python, as in many other languages, we declare a variable by assigning it a value with the equal sign. How many people know R? Okay. Um, how many people feel strongly about the arrow, uh, the assignment error in R? You could feel strongly in the positive direction. I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I have strong feelings. I do not like it. I mean, you don't have to use it in R, of course, and you probably shouldn't because there's only like one edge case in which it would be an issue. In Python, you declare a variable by assigning it a value with the equal sign. Um, uh, 
and we'll, we'll get into code in a moment, uh, Python supports a variety of data types. So all of these things hopefully will look familiar to you because they exist in pretty much every language, right? Booleans, true or false, uh, numbers, different kinds of number objects. We have integers, floats, um, so on. Strings, of course, right? So uh, you have the string representations of things. Lists, uh, lists are the equivalent of um, arrays in many other languages. Uh, they're ordered collections of things. And I'll give you examples of all these in a second. Dictionaries, so uh, sometimes called associative arrays or hash tables, where you have key value pairs, right? So you have a key that, that basically uh, uh, lets you uh, enter the dictionary at the exact the, uh, place you want based on the key, and many other uh, data types. Now, one thing that we don't do in Python, and again, this will be familiar to you coming from languages like R, MATLAB, et cetera, we, you don't have to assign a variable's type at assignment. So when you, when you first uh, initialize a variable, you never say, well, you, don't, you could say under certain circumstances, but you generally don't have to say, oh, this is an integer. This is a, an array with 20 elements of strings. Um, Python uses what's called duct typing, so that idea is that um, you just declare a variable and what will happen when you try to do something with that variable is Python will just try to do it, right? So if you say, well, I want to take this object and, and convert it to lowercase, Python interpreter will try to do that. And if your object is like an integer, so it doesn't make sense to convert an integer to lowercase, then you'll get a message, right? But it's not, again, it's not like there's a compiler sitting there checking when you first compile that code to make sure that you're trying to do something on an integer that can't be done. And so there are costs, but the idea is that um, you save yourself a lot of effort by not having to declare types. So if that's a little bit abstract, don't worry about it, and I will get into some code, and I'll, I'll show you what, what these all look like in practice. Um, and again, I think, how many people are familiar with the Jupyter Notebook, or at least, or, okay, pretty much everyone, that's good. So I, I'll talk about it a bit, but I won't, I'll defer that for a moment. So uh, here are just some simple examples, right, so of, of in, initializing variables. So here's an integer, um, let's say age underscore in underscore years. Languages have their different naming conventions. Some are sort of stricter about them than others. Not forces you to declare variables like this. You could have said age in years. But I will say that the, the Python community is, is sort of pretty pedantic about some of these conventions. It's, I would, in my view, a strength because it makes it much easier to read other people's code. So um, there's a style document. I think I may link to it at some point. It's worth just skimming through just to get a sense of these conventions, although you'll probably pick them up by looking at code. So the, the convention for variables is you separate, it's always lowercase and you separate um, words with underscore. What is this called? I forget. Ariel, you know? What's the, the name for this like name, name convention underscores separating words? Um, it's like snake case or snake case? Sna okay, it is snake case, okay. Um, so uh, we can run this, of course, and now we've, we've assigned the value 30 to this variable called age in years. Again, this should not shock anybody. Uh, if we wanted to initialize a float, then we would do it just by declaring the float. Again, you don't have to say, oh, by the way, this is a float. You can tell, and right? you can infer that too from, in this case, from the, 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 the decimal there. Right? This cannot be an integer because it has um, values after that decimal. So this is almost pi. Um, what about a string? Again, just assign the string to the variable you want. No surprises there. A is for apple, B is for banana, right, and so on. Uh, this is just like in any other language. You, of course, are all enjoying this tutorial very much so far, so we will assign the value true to our enjoying tutorial um, uh, Boolean variable. Okay. So those are all sort of very basic data types. Um, where you start to see some divergence between languages when you start talking about data structures like lists or arrays, um, dictionaries, etc. What is a list? In Python, at least, in most languages, well, that's not entirely true. So in Python, a list is an ordered, heterogeneous collection of objects. What do I mean by heterogeneous? Okay. Yeah, so right, exactly. So a list can have different types. Uh, in many languages, that's not possible. So you would have to say, this is a list of strings, and you can't have like one element be uh, an integer and another be a string. Uh, but in Python, you can. Uh, list elements can be accessed by position. So you can index into a list and say, hey, I want the third element. So um, here we have a list of random stuff, and we can fill it with stuff. Um, so we can have an apple, uh, we can have the number six, we can have, we can have other variables, right? So we can, we can add that variable that we just created, uh, and so on. And so now we have a list called random stuff that contains three elements, the string apple, 
the integer six and a variable, which is also we know, although nothing about this tells you that, but we know because we've already assigned an integer to that, so we know that age in years is an integer with a value 30. Um, okay, now we have this list, and so now suppose we wanted to get the second element in the list. Every language has its conven own convention for indexing, but the most common thing you'll see, and this is true in Python as well, is you would index by um, uh, the integer position that you want. Now, if you're coming from R, it's a very big difference here. Right? Holy wars have been started over like whether it's better to index from zero or from one. I don't think it really matters. It's just a convention, right? You can argue until you're blue in the face. Just be aware that uh, that Python, like most, I think, languages that come out of computer science, indexes from zero. So the first element is zero. So if you say, I want the zeroth element within this list, random stuff, you're going to get Apple, right? This would give you, I think, an error in, in R. Um, if you do one, which would give you the first element in, in R, you're going to get six, right? So you think of it always as like it's the, the nth element. So the zeroth element is the first one. Um, MATLAB, I think, also indexes from one, right? It's been a while for me. Okay, yeah. Um, so that might be a little bit of a difference, and you might find yourself having to sort of like pause and real if you have bugs in your code and like you know list indexing errors. It's a good chance that you you've made a mistake and you forgot and you need to start at one, uh, or I'm mean, sorry, at zero. Um, now we can also slice lists. Let's just to make this kind of clear. Let's add a few more values to this. Um, all right, so here's our five element list now. Um, we can pull out chunks of that list. We can say, well, I want the second, or so the second through the uh, fourth um, element. Okay, so this, this colon means basically up to. You can read it as up to. So we're, we're saying in this case, start at the, the one position, so the second element, and keep grabbing elements until you hit the fourth position, exclusive. So this will give us element at index one, two, and three. And so that's what you have here, um, right? So it's basically taking this chunk out. Um, and there's also there's tricks like that. You can also do fancier things like you can you can optionally step. You can pass a step, so you can say, I want to start at one, go to four, but get, take, give me every, every second um, element. Um, and you can also go backwards in the list. There's all, all sorts of little tricks like that. I will say that, again, this is a very basic tutorial. Uh, I have a separate one prepared that I've done in previous years that's sort of like tips and tricks in Python. So if there's enough interest, I'm happy to do that. There's an unscheduled thing later this week, so just let me know, and we can certainly find a time uh, for that. Um, Okay, how would we append an element? So you have a list, you want to add an element. It's a very common use of a list, right? Is to keep track of stuff. Um, and this is where Python actually gets a little verbose compared to some other dynamic languages. In this case, you have an append uh, method. And I'll talk a little bit about why I call this a method and not a function, but if you're used to sort of uh, procedural programming where you, you can define little sort of chunks of code that are functions, right? It's essentially the same thing. It's just that it's, we're calling that function it, you can think of it as belonging to this random stuff object, which is a list, right? So the list has some, some functionality, and append is one of the things that's defined. You can, you can basically say, hey, random stuff, please append what I'm about to give you, and then you can add uh, another element of your choice here. So you can say random stuff uh, append. And so now if we want to look at our list, so this is modifying that list, uh, what's called in place, meaning it's not returning, this doesn't return a new list with that element appended, it's actually modified that list you gave it. So you want to be careful about this stuff because you will change, uh, some, some methods like append will change the thing that you're working with, right? They're not going to give you a copy. Uh, but you can see now that, that, that our random stuff list now has six elements instead of five. We just add one onto the end. Okay. Um, Dictionaries are the other super common kind of data structure uh, that you'll find in Python. Again, most languages have an equivalent. Uh, dictionaries are unordered collections of key to value pairs. This technically is no longer true in Python 3, which hopefully you're all using. Yep. Oh, sure. Uh, so that's, uh, that's an excellent question. If you were going to design a language, given your question, what would you call a method that does that? Insert, okay, yeah. Well, that's an excellent question. So yeah, I, I think this is right, right? So random stuff, um, and, oops, insert, and so uh, this is a little tip, and I think, well, if I don't cover it, I'm sure, I'm sure Fernando will uh, tomorrow, I'm talking about the Jupyter Notebook. 
Uh, if you're in the Jupyter Notebook, you can hit Shift Tab inside a method signature, and it shows you uh, inside the parentheses, and it'll show you the signature. And so here it's saying, uh, what you, for insert, the first argument is the index you want to insert at, and the object is the second one. So if I did insert one, uh, um, 500, where will that go in that list? My guess is in between Apple and six, right? And so just to make sure that's true, let's insert and then we'll print this right away. There we go, right? So. Another kind of tip is if you ever wonder, like, what can a list do or what can any object do in Python? We'll talk about what objects are in a moment. You can always, if you're working in, uh, in an IDE or even in Jupyter Notebook, which will do sort of completion for you, you can just do uh, period and then tab, and it'll tell you here's all the things that this object can do. So it can, you can call append, clear, copy, count, extend, and insert, and so on. So that's a nice way to figure out what is it that this object can do that's in front of me. Uh, just uh, type the period and then tab. And you can start typing and it'll do completion, right? So if you do CO and then tab, it'll show you, well, the only completions are copy and, and count. Um, okay. Okay, so the other, as I said, uh, super common uh, data type is uh, a dictionary. It's an unordered collection of key to value pairs. In, in Python 3, it's no longer unordered technically, but that doesn't matter. Just it's good to think of this as an unordered collection, which is to say, unlike a list, right, list elements maintain an order. If you add an element, if you have a five element list, you add another element, that element is now in position six. And if you want to get to it, you have to ask for it at position six. Dictionaries do not have order. So when you add an element or a new key value pair to a dictionary, you cannot say, give me the sixth pair I added. That does not make any sense on most dictionary implementations. Um, however, what's really useful about dictionary elements is they can be accessed by a particular key, which is actually extremely efficient uh, from a search standpoint. So you can't say, give me the third element, but you can say, hey, I know I stored an element with the key uh, coffee. Please give me the value stored at coffee, right? So for example, here's a dictionary. Remember, most structures in Python, including dictionaries, are heterogeneous. So we can create a dictionary. And uh, another thing I will mention, actually, most of these data types can be initialized in different ways. So you can, for example, for lists, you could say A equals list. Um, and that's a fine way to initialize a list. But if you see this kind of thing, the square brackets also are initializing a list. And the same thing for dictionary. You can additionalize a dictionary by saying, uh, apple equals 0 0.65, mango equals 1.5, so on. It's more common to see, though, this kind of thing. And this is unambiguous. If you see the, these uh, curly braces and then key value pairs, then you know that someone is initializing a dictionary. So we are creating a dictionary and we're storing pairs. We're saying at the key apple, I want you to store the value 0 0.65. At the key mango, store the value 1.5. Uh, Etc. Again, heterogeneous values can be different types. So can the keys. So we could have said instead of making the key strawberry, make the key six. Oops, sorry, that's a string. We can do this. That's also fine. This can. It's important to remember, though, right? That like if you if you if I do this, and then if I then say fruit prices six, notice that the way you index into a dictionary is the same as a list. This is not saying give me the sixth L or the, really the seventh element in the, in the in the dictionary. It's saying, give me the value stored at, at the key six. So this can be quite tricky, and this is why some people this this, this is why some people from come, who are sort of coming from like a C or Java background, where you have to declare the type of everything, can get kind of annoyed with languages like Python because it's actually quite easy to if you forget that this is a dictionary and you start thinking of it as a list, bad things can happen, right? And on top of this, remember you, there's no compilation, so nothing is going to tell you at any point hey, you're doing something funny, you might run this in a production server somewhere thinking this is trying to get like the, the sixth element and all of a sudden this fails. Um, and so you want to be aware of these kind of things. Uh, one kind of good, I, I, you know, a convention I tend to use is not to make integers keys for this reason, right? Because then there's no ambiguity um, where, you, where you don't know if this is uh, um, a, uh, an index into a list or a key. And if you were to make that a, a, a string, then of course there's no ambiguity. If you see this thing, then you know it's a dictionary. You can't ask for a list, you know, what is the value in the list at six? That doesn't make any sense. Does that sort of make sense? Um, so if we declare the, the dictionary this way, and then we ask for the value stored at the key six, and again, just to kind of make it maybe a little less confusing, let's go back to the original thing. If we were to say, hey, we've got these fruit prices stored in this dictionary, and now somebody comes into your store and says, well, I want to buy a mango. So you say, hey, uh, hold on a second. I'm going to look up what the price of the mango is. It's 1.5. Right? And again, you can store as many 
as many values as you have room for in your dictionaries, you have room in memory, you can store whatever it, uh, types of, uh, you want uh, in the values. Um, questions about dictionaries? Uh, once again, if you want to know what can dictionaries do, you can always either go read the, doc the documentation online or you can just sort of hit dot and then tab and then see like what you can do. And you can, for example, well, I'll, 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 I'll defer iteration for the moment, but, um, but that's the basic uh, dictionary in Python. Super useful data structure. You'll see this all over the place. All right, so I've already kind of done this. If you want to know what the price of the mango is, right? And, and uh, hopefully some of you are, are so if you're completely new to Python, you're sort of playing along as we go through and, and using the notebooks to actually uh, work through some of these things. Um, what if we want to add a new entry for pairs? So this is actually easier than appending to a list, or at least it's less verbose. When you have a dictionary, you can just basically tack on whatever you want then and there. So you can say uh, the fruit price of pairs as of now, I'm just declaring that the value stored at, at pairs is, uh, I'd say pairs are really expensive for some reason. 215 is the price of a pair. Um, and done. So now you have an extra, another additional value. Question, what happens if I do this? Any intuitions? Um, what, would, what would my dictionary look like if I, if I execute this line? Yeah, I overwrite, right? So there's no, there's no warning, nothing says, hey, you're about to overwrite this value. The understanding is if you assign a new value to the an existing key, then um, you expect it to be overridden, right? So if I do this and then we just, let's see what's in our fruit prices dictionary at this point. Now the new value, the price has gone up. Apples have gone up by 10 cents. Right? So again, also very useful to be able to sort of on the fly dynamically change values, have heterogeneous data types, et cetera. But you do have to keep these kind of behaviors in mind and they become automatic after a while. I'm sure for those of you who've worked in other languages, that's true in whatever language you're used to working in. Okay, now there's a, I'm gonna let you know a little secret. So I talked about basic data types in uh, Python, but the truth is that there's, in Python there's not, not really basic data types like there are in other languages. Like if you, if you learn to program in Java, uh, then you might have been taught that you know, Java has objects, but they're all sort of these, these very fundamental data types that you get out of the box, you can't play with them, they just look completely different from other stuff. Uh, that's not true in Python. Actually in Python, everything is an object, including the data types I just showed you. Um, what does that mean? What is an object? Um, an object, well, how many people have some object-oriented programming experience? Okay, like maybe half of you, okay, so. Uh, so an object is really just what it sounds like. An object is a sort of defined thing that has some state and some behavior. So we could talk about like, um, you know, if I were to talk about like a rock as being an object, you could say, well, what is the rock state? What kind of variables could, how could you describe that rock? And you might say, well, the weight is a property of the rock. Rock, rock can weigh more, can weigh less. Those are properties of that rock, right? So it has a certain state and it can change. We could file off some of that rock and now its value for weight would change. Um, so just think of an object as a thing that has some, some properties. It can do certain things. It uh, can be described in certain ways. And um, in Python, everything is an object, including the data types I showed you. What you can do with those data types def depends on the object's definition. Um, so for example, um, and I'll show you examples in a second, even something seemingly basic as the multiplication operator, which you might think of sort of intuitively as like multiplication, of course, like if your data types are numbers, then they magically know how to multiply by other numbers, right? But they don't magically know anything. Uh, somewhere in the Python standard library, somebody wrote a chunk of code that is basically a definition of a, an object called an integer or a float that has certain behaviors, one of which is multiply, right? So it's, the definition says, here's what you do when you multiply one, uh, one object by another. So, Let's look at this in detail. So let's say we, want, we have an integer. We have our age and years uh, variable, right? Um, and we want to multiply that by two. So we can do that, that's not hard. We just multiply by two and the answer is 60. I know no surprises there. Um, what about a float? So we have our approximation to pi and we multiply that by two. What am I gonna get? 6.28, right? All right, no surprises there. Uh, again, these are not, I'm just going to emphasize, and I'll show you this in a second, this will break down at some point. These are not sort of magical properties of numbers. Um, they are properties of certain objects called integers and floats. What about a string? Okay, now this is where it gets interesting. People have intuitions. Um, if I say apple, what do people think will happen? If you know the answer, then, then don't answer. But like if you haven't tried this before in Python, 
What's your intuition about what's going to happen here? What's that? The price? Um, okay, that's, that's one thought. But the, remember, this is just a string apple, so this has no connection to anything else. And just to make that clear, um, let's say we take table, which we haven't seen before. Right? So this, we're actually defining a new string in the moment. So we're basically creating a new object uh, string called, called table, and we're then saying multiply this by two. Any other intuitions? Okay, error. That's a common one, right? So this, this just shouldn't work, because what does it mean to multiply a string by two? Other ideas? Table, table, okay. Other ideas? What's that? A list of table, table. A list of table, yeah. So you can see that you don't know, right? And people have different intuitions about what should happen. But there is a definition somewhere that tells you how this object is going to behave. And so the nice thing is we can try this out. We know that this is a string because we initialized it wrapped in quotes. So it's a string. And we multiply this by two. And sure enough, someone said table, table. And it, table, table is the right answer. Right? But this on its face is kind of weird in, in some sense, right? Because like everyone has strong intuitions about what should happen for numbers. There's no principled reason why Python should behave this way. Uh, you might have expected it to give you an error, but probably early on in language development, someone thought, well, look, it would be super helpful if you just want to duplicate a, a value multiple times if you have this convention. So they, in that method, there is a, or sorry, in that object for string, there is a method that basically defines the behavior when you try to multiply by something. I'll show you how, what that looks like in a second. Um, and of course, you could do this four times if you want, table, 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 and so on. Um, OK, what else? What about a list? So we have our random stuff list. What's this going to give us? The intuitions now? Multiplying our list by two? So you might, at this point, start building off your intuitions for string. Or there is some internal consistency here. Uh, I'll save you the, 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 the suspense. It does sort of what you, see, what you might expect after seeing string. It concatenates the list. So it just kind of creates another list that's sort of a copy twice, same list twice, with one, with one copy directly appended to the previous one. And so if we did this four times, then it would just grow. And so now you have the same elements four times over. Still a list, though. Um, OK. What about a dictionary? OK, in keeping with the theme, any intuitions? Uh, what did we call our dictionary? Fruit prices. Right. What is this going to do? Multiply each element by two. Multiply each by two. OK, other intuitions? OK, let's try and see. Uh, error. Does not like that. OK? So the decision was made again at some point that the, the dictionary uh, object type should not respond to that. When you ask it to multiply uh, by a number, it says, I'm sorry, I don't know. I've, I've, you know no, nobody told me what to do when I see this kind of thing. Um, right. Again, it could have been, different choices could have been made, but that's the way it's implemented in Python. Now, I'm showing you this mainly so you get a sense that like, it's not like these things are sort of given. Um, I mean, they are in some sense. Those are the constraints of the language. But the way to think about this is that None of these things are special. They're all just objects that someone has defined. And somewhere in that code, and I'll show you where in a second, it says exactly what the object can do, like what happens when you try to multiply by something. Um, and I'll come back to that, I, I think, in a bit. OK. Uh, let's breeze through control structures, because these probably will, if you if you program any other language, these will look more or less the same. So control structures are language features that allow us to control how code is executed. Um, so things like iteration, right? for loops, while statements. So um, for each blah in this list of blahs, take one at a time, do something with it, and then go on to the next one. While, uh, so keep doing something until some condition is met, and then stop. Right? Conditionals, if then else statements, probably I, I don't need to belabor the point. And there's others, and you can go and read what all the different control structures in Python are. Um, so uh, if we want to write an if then else statement, let's say we want to, we want to uh, we want to print some statement conditional on the price of apples, which we've already seen went up recently. And so uh, we might say, if fruit prices uh, for apple, so we have our dictionary and we're indexing it. We're saying, like, check that value stored at the key apple. And if that's greater than, let's say, 70 cents, we're not willing to pay more than 70 cents for an apple, uh, then we might want to print uh, Hell no, I'm not paying that much for an apple. It's an unreasonable price for an apple. Uh, but otherwise, we'll take six, OK? So if I run this, what's going to happen? Does anyone remember what the value is? What am I going to see? It's 
Anyone remember what the, what the value of Apple in this dictionary is set to right now? Right, 75 cents, and so this should object, and in fact it does, right? So we have sort of branching. Um, we've asked, we're basically, behave, we're asking our code to behave differently depending on what happens in this, in this expression here. If you're coming from R and many other languages, you might be used to uh, either, you know, uh, either parentheses or uh, actually usually parentheses, right? Something like this. In Python, you don't need those. It's, it's not bad practice to do it anyway, although it's more typing. Um, so this may look more like what you're used to, um, but you don't need that. One other thing to note here is the indentation, which you may have noticed already if you've dabbled in Python. Um, Python has what's called semantic white space. It takes indentation seriously, meaning you can't just put, write your code however you want, right? Like you can't, for example, you couldn't do this. I don't think you could do this, we'll find out. If I, if I try to do this, it gives you an error. Why? Because in the, the, the standard for the language is defined to be the case that if you start an if statement like this, you have to indent on the next line. Right? You cannot have the next statement start at the same level of indentation as that if statement. How much you indent is up to you. Convention is for most people's conventions, I think in, in the stock conventions, four spaces. That's fine, though. You could do two if you want. The, the reason for this is just to kind of enforce some clarity on the code. And this is one of the things that is annoying to many people when they start writing Python code, but actually is really good from a clarity standpoint because it, it means that if you read someone else's Python code, you'll have a hard, much easier time understanding. And if you've ever read, read, read like Perl code or a lot of Ruby code, you get a lot of these one-liners. People write actually ours the same way. It was just like, like 700 characters on one line, and it's very hard to parse that. So this forces you to be a little clearer about what you're, what you're doing. There's a question? Uh, so if you, uh, it's a uh, uh, pep eight. I think I linked to it somewhere. But if you just uh, Google Python style conventions, it'll take you to the, the document, and that's worth just going through. And what you'll find is that, as I mentioned, people are really good about following that for the most part. Some things not so much, like length of lines, and those are sort of not less important things. Indentation, you don't have a choice about. Uh, you have to indent for the the, sort of the standard. So that's c control structures. Um, now, let me zoom out a little bit. Uh, so now let's, let's, uh, let's look at for loops. So we want to loop over the random stuff list we created earlier, and we'll print each value. Okay, so, um, so we have our list, and the for loops in, in Python are actually fairly, is another nice, nice feature of, of Python, they look fairly language-like. They look like, like, almost like natural language. Right? You have the word like for, and you can say for uh, fruit in fruit prices, so this really gives you, I think, a nice feeling for what's happening here. Saying for every fruit in that in that list, or sorry, in that in that yeah, this is uh, oh my bad, sorry. I'm thinking ahead. Um, let's just say for every element in that random stuff list, we're just going to print that. So we're just going to say um, the value is, and the print statement uh, allows you to just separate stuff by commas. There are other ways you can format things to candidate them, but I won't show you those here. Um, so we can just do this, and here you go. Right? We're just printing every element in that list. So notice what we're doing here. We're actually taking every element in that list, and we're taking the actual value of it. So when you do four A and B, you're going to get the value of each element in that list. What if you want the index? right? So what if you don't want to, to take the value? Because notice if you're like in here, if you're inside this for loop, very often you actually need to know the index. Right? You might need to check, well, if, if I've gone past 100 elements, I want to stop, or I want to do something else. But you can't do that here, because inside this, this for loop, we have no way of, of knowing what the integer is, what the index is. We can't d determine for this element what its list position is. It has no memory. It doesn't know that it came from a list that had 15 elements and it was the seventh element. So what we would have to do then is we would have to kind of, in advance, set up the, the loop so that we know the index. And um, there's various ways to do that. For example, if we knew that there are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, seven um, elements in that list, that we could say four i in range of seven, and that's basically saying, so range uh, is a function that will give you something that is kind of like the list. I won't get into the technicalities. They will just start at zero, then go to one, then to two, and it'll stop at whatever value you give it. So this will give you the value zero through seven. And if I, if I uh, print this now, well, actually, if I, if I print this, right, so the, the, let's say the index is, and then that will print that value. 
Right, so now our loop is actually looping over just, just integers. In, in every position, we know the value uh, that's being passed in. So now what can we do? If we need to know both the index and the value, so how would we now print the values of the, the, the list elements, given this knowledge? Anybody? I know many of you know the answer, so humor me. Um, so I, if I just want to print the value of each of those, uh, those elements in the random stuff list, yeah, so I can do uh, the index, and I can say the value is, well, actually, let's do this. So now uh, we'll, we'll, the value at index uh, curly braces is more curly braces. And this is a way of, of formatting strings. Python has several ways you can format strings. Um, this one, the way it works is you kind of leave these placeholders. This is a placeholder that's basically to be filled later. And then when you call format, you can now pass in the variables you want. And they're filled in sort of one by one. There's more complexity than that if you wanted. But, but this idea is here, if I pass in um, uh, two variables, so I'm passing in the index position i and then the random stuff, the index in the random stuff list, uh, then that's what it prints out. And there's actually other ways you can do this in Python, so just really quick, Python also lets you, uh, there's a little convenience thing, you can actually call this enumerate thing. Uh, if you say for i, um, comma, val in enumerate uh, random stuff, then that is basically sort of a shortcut way of doing what I just showed you where it's now looping over both the, in every, at every, in every uh, element, it's, it's keeping the index and passing it in. So now I can just do this. For every uh, pair of, of values, i and val, um, which are always the index and then the value of that element, um, and exactly the same result. Okay. And these little things you just pick up as you work with Python, you'll, you'll see some of this in someone's code, you'll be like, what the heck is enumerate? And then you'll see, it. oh, it's helpful now. I don't have to sort of loop over the indexes and then explicitly grab the, uh, the value from the list. Um, there are other sort of idioms that you don't actually find in, in, in many other languages that are kind of nice. So Python has something called a list comprehension, which is really just a shortcut way of writing a for loop. So you can say, um, um, we're going to do exactly the same thing. This will look kind of confusing if you haven't seen this before. I'll just keep it simple here. I'll use a different way of formatting strings without explanation. Um, uh, what is it? Okay. So you can ignore the none, 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 none has because it has to return something. But, but the, the, the point is that what you're actually looking at, it's a little confusing, but it's a very short way. It's a one line way of writing uh, a for loop. And the idea is you just read it as do blah for every value in random stuff. So it's the exact equivalent of doing exactly the same way you did before. Right? This is exactly the same as writing for value in random stuff. But it becomes very convenient because it's compact. And you can also nest list comprehensions. You can have sort of multiple levels, although I don't generally recommend this. It's going to be very confusing to read. So you should probably avoid those. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about namespaces and imports. I think I'm way behind where I want to be, but that's okay because almost everything in the second half is going to be covered in much more detail in other tutorials. Um, one of the things that might annoy you if you're coming from other languages, like MATLAB or R in particular, is that you have to explicitly import everything you want to use, right? So many of you probably have had this experience where like you want to call some function and it doesn't, there's no, that's not available. It says like, cannot find that or something. And then you realize you actually have to import that explicitly. You have to say, I'm going to use this exact thing, and I have to locate it within the sort of global uh, 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 space of modules that Python knows about, and explicitly say, I'm going to use this chunk of code. Please make it available. That off, this often annoys beginners, but it's actually really, really helpful as you try to develop larger chunks of code. And the reason is because it really makes so that it's, it's much harder to run into cases where you have conflicts between names. And if you've worked in R for a long time, then you will know, right, what ha the horrors that happen. And this is so, like, people do this without even thinking about it in R. Like, they'll say, like, well, just attach this, this namespace, and it explodes everything in that. So when you call attach, it basically makes everything within that, 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 that collection of, of, uh, of functions or objects or whatever available to you in the global namespace. And then you get things like 
warning, X is masked, Y is masked, and that means that now the thing that you that was defined at that name previously is now overwritten by white, right? That's a, a bad thing to do. And so Python enforces this kind of clarity by making you import things um, explicitly. Annoying at first, but you get used to it quickly, and then you just run into these kind of issues much less often. There's different ways to import. There's different ways to say, um, I want to use this chunk of code. Please let me use it. So here are three ways. So let's say we want to import the default dict data structure, which is a dictionary just like the ones we saw, except that when you, uh, except it has a default value. So if you try to do something, at a, 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 you try to access a key that doesn't exist, instead of failing and saying, sorry, there's no such apple. I don't, you know, I don't know what apple is. There's no key like that. Um, it'll actually have a, a uh, or sorry, when you, when you, well, I butchered that. I don't want to get into details, uh, just in the issue of time. Um, it's a, it's a dictionary with a little extra stuff. Okay. And that's the point, it doesn't really matter what it does for our purposes. The point is we, want, we just want to say that we want to be able to use this. And so one thing we can do is we can say from collections, which is where it lives, Python has a collections module. Inside that, one of the, the uh, things you can use is default dict. So you can say from, let me just comment this out for a moment, from collections, import default dict. And you're saying inside this thing you know about, because it's a standard library, it comes bundled with Python, uh, just import that, and so now you can initialize a new object just by calling default date. If you didn't uh, do this, I should have done this before I imported because it's not trivial to unimport. Um, they wouldn't have worked. It would have failed and said, I don't know what default date is. But now that we've imported it, we can do that. Just to show you for the next example, let's say that I try uh, doing this. I say assign to variable b uh, a new dd. And Python will say, I have no idea what this dd function or object or whatever is. I've never seen it before. But we're going to fix that right now. We're going to import, again, from collections. So we're importing the exact same object. All we're doing here is we're actually saying, hey, when you import that, I want you to make it available not as default dict, like here, but rename it, basically. Just import it as DD. And this you'll see all over the place in Python. People tend to abbreviate commonly used modules. So you'll see like NumPy, which you'll see all the next two weeks. Um, import it as NP. Just a convention, you can call it whatever you want, but it's good to use the same convention as everyone else, because then we see NP, you know people are using NumPy, and you have to type all those characters. So we might import it as uh, DD, and so now if we run this, it doesn't complain, which means it worked. It assigned a new default dict object. Lastly, we might want not to clutter up our namespace. So if we're going to be importing just tons of all kinds of data structures and functions, whatever, we might want to keep it clean in that. So maybe we don't actually want to have default dict be yet another thing in our namespace that we could accidentally uh, call. So we can just say, let's just import collections. Maybe we're going to be using a whole bunch of things inside collections. And so it's just cleaner if we import the collections module, and then we can still call into that. We can say, like, inside this thing that we already imported, uh, please uh, call this default dict. Object. And so all these are perfectly legitimate. And if you want to verify that nothing here has changed, we've just imported exactly the same code in three different ways and assigned it to three different variables, then we can just verify that A equals B equals C. Right? We initialized a new default dictionary in all these cases, and the answer is yes. Right. So it can be frustrating at first, but it is actually very helpful. It allows you to manage the things you're working with in a much, much cleaner way um, than, than in many other languages. Although a lot of this is convention. Like you can manage your objects nicely in other languages. It's just that people tend not to because it's not enforced. Uh, functions, probably most, if not all of you, are familiar with functions. A function is just a block of code that runs when you explicitly invoke it, right? So it's like a chunk of code that sits there waiting to be uh, invoked or called. And it can accept, um, and well, in many cases, arguments or parameters that change its behavior, which make functions very powerful. So you don't have to just call uh, the, the same, you know, you don't have to write a new function every time you want to change the behavior slightly. You can accept a parameter that controls what that function does. And in Python, this is different in some languages, Python, a, a function can accept any number or type of inputs, always returns a single object. Now it can return a list, so there are ways to, to return what looks like multiple objects, but technically you're always returning a single object for a function. Uh, or nothing, you can also return none, which is a, I should have mentioned, none is a special, it basically means like null or none. Um, so here's a simple function. We import, as you just saw, we import random. We're going to be using the random number generation uh, tools. Here's how you define a, a function in Python. Let's call it a function add noise. Def means you're de defining uh, a function. So def add noise is the name of the function. Notice the naming convention, right? Snake case. So this is true of functions as well. Functions and variables have the same naming conventions. Uh, in other languages, like in JavaScript, you would probably want to do this. Not the case here. Um, and 
what are we doing here? Again, this is very similar to R. So the Python, the function signatures in Python are, are, look a lot like R. Right? So you can have mandatory arguments x. You have to pass this. If you don't pass this x, if you don't pass at least one value when you call this function, Python will complain. But after that, you can have optional values. So, so mu here equals zero. That's basically saying, again, same as in R, uh, if, if no value is passed, then the default becomes zero. And for SD, standard deviation, if no value is passed, the default is one, which means the user does not have to pass those values. They can if they want. So if they pass a value, it will override this default. But if they don't, it won't complain. And this is a doc string. Uh, there are different conventions about how to write doc strings. It is a really good idea to get into the habit, right? So scientists tend not to write documentation. If you get used to it early on, it becomes much easier. You just do it as you're going, and then you don't have this like, oh, now I have to go back and like write doc strings for my entire code base. So even for something this simple, it's not a bad idea to actually explain exactly what's going on. Different style conventions for this. Um, here we're just, this is like a short description. And then we're saying what the parameters are and what they do. So parameter x is a number, um, the number to add noise to. So it can be in a drawer or float. Um, this is not like you know, nothing, well, that's not entirely, you don't really, I mean, it's not like nothing was checking to make sure that these are valid types or whatever. It's just a description that's helpful to the user. And so uh, here I'm saying mu, I expect mu to be a float. It's the mean of the Gaussian noise distribution. SD is this also a float, standard deviation of the noise distribution. And this thing will return a float. So what does it do? Well, it takes a number and adds some noise to it. Just samples randomly from, the, from a Gaussian distribution and returns a Gaussian distribution defined by this mu and this standard deviation and returns the sum of the value you gave it and that noise. And the noise here is generated. In the random um, module has this normal variate um, function and returns that value. So if we just run this, nothing happens because we're just defining this function. Right? We haven't actually called it. It's just sitting there in memory waiting for someone to invoke it. Now let's try calling it. So we say uh, add noise, I don't know, four. Um, and if we just run that, well actually, sorry, let's try this first. Let's say we don't pass anything at all. Does not like that. Why? Because x is mandatory, right? There's no default value. So you have to pass at least one argument. If you don't, Python interpreter will complain. But if you pass that one value, that gets assigned to x. And then it will add the noise internally. So we don't know what value we're going to get here because there's some random number generation involved. But we can keep rerunning this. And you can see that it's just adding uh, some noise drawn from a normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation of, of 1. And we could change that. We could say, well, I want the mean of that distribution to be 100 and the standard deviation to be 30, which, of course, will dominate that value for we're feeding in. And there you go. Right? And so now we have this chunk of code that can sit there and we can call it whenever we want. And its behavior is determined by the parameters we feed in, which is quite helpful. OK. Um, last sort of, th 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 sort of code piece I want to talk about um, is classes. So I mentioned that everything in Python is an object. And where do these come from? Like what defines these, what these objects and what they can do? Uh, a class is a, basically a template. It's a definition of a particular object. And it defines the variables in the object, uh, an object contains and what it can do with them. So we could, for example, define a circle class. I will say that, you know, probably many of you, everything I've shown you so far, you have some equivalent in other languages. It's surprising how far people can get in other languages without ever actually encountering object-oriented programming. And so this may be new. And if it is, this will probably, you know, you might have some trouble wrapping your head around what a class is. It's completely normal. I remember it took me probably like, you know, three, four months just to really actually get a sense of like how objects actually work. So this may not make intuitive sense. That's OK. I'm just kind of giving you a very schematic overview of how a lot of Python is built. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to define a new object. Right? We have integers. We have strings. Those are all predefined. We are going to define a new class called a circle. Um, we're going to need math just to define um, uh, um, Actually, pi. I think we're only going to import pi from that math class. So we're going to we're going to write a circle class. We're going to define a new kind of object in its behavior, and the way you do that in Python is just by uh, just that. That's that's it. In fact, if I just said pass here, that's a valid class. There is now uh, in memory a definition uh, circle. There's an object there. It doesn't do anything, but it exists. And in fact, we could actually now create new circles. They don't do anything, but they'll just sit there. So we could say circle equals circle parentheses. And that's how you, uh, you initialize a, a new instance of that class. 
Now, this is where it starts to get sort of conceptually difficult if you haven't seen this before. When we do this, we're creating a, a, a new instance or a new, a new, if you can think of like, let's say, uh, right, um, 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 we're not basically, we're not assigning this, this sort of definition to this variable. We're actually creating a new circle. We're saying take this definition and basically print a new version of whatever it is this thing is, so a new circle. And we could do this, so we could say circle one, we could say circle two, right? And so we can keep doing this. We can just create new circles uh, as if this was a factory. Like circle is just a factory that spits out these individual circle objects, just like we can have multiple num multiple integers, right? Nothing will happen here because these are just empty, I mean, this is just a pointer to this circle thing that does nothing. We haven't defined any behavior for the circle, but now we're going to. So uh, what do we want our circle to do? Well, um, one thing we might want it to do is store some information. We might want this to keep some state around. This is completely idiosyncratic to Python, so you will not see the sort of double underscore in many languages. Um, and I'll explain this slightly. I won't get into the details of it because it will take a while to actually sort of understand, explain why, what the self thing is doing. So for now, just, just to, I mean, there's a good reason why this looks the way it does, but just take it as sort of, uh, you know, an article of faith that this is how you, def you define an initializer for a, an object. What you're basically saying is when someone tries to create a new circle, when they call circle parentheses, this gets invoked automatically. It's a special, it's called, called a magic method. So when you, when you call, you know, internally what happens when you say, um, when I say, you know, C equals circle, this chunk of code will get executed. Now, any guesses what will happen if I try to run this? Yeah, I'll get an error. Why? Well, because we're expecting an argument here. Right? We're expecting radius, and it's mandatory. Why are we doing this? Well, because we want people to tell us, we want the user to tell us what the radius of the circle is when they first create it. Right? That's our way of saying we're expecting this variable called radius, and what we're doing here is assigning it internally. We're basically saying, hey, keep this value around. If we didn't do this, then it would disappear after initialization. I'll show you that. So if we just do this, all right, so this will still, oh, sorry, if we now pass in a radius, so this radius is equal to four, that works fine. But now if I say, hey, what's your radius? So internally these properties are stored, and you can access them with the dot syntax, right? So if I say, hey, circle, but I just created, what's your radius? It doesn't know because it has no attribute radius. We didn't tell it to keep that around. So self is a sort of a, a reference to the thing itself. Um, again, the point I won't really explain now is why it always shows up in the first argument. I'm happy to talk about that afterwards. Um, if we do this now, that'll work fine, right? So just to kind of recap the logic, we're creating a new circle. Uh, we're creating a new object of class circle. When we do this, the interpreter looks inside here, executes this code. It knows that you're passing a radius, which is four, and it stores that value for internally. And now that'll sit there permanently or until the session ends, right? So now we can always access that value by saying C dot radius, and it will tell us what that is. Um, okay, what else do we wanna do here? Uh, we wanna add a method. So it's all well and good to have this value stored, but we probably want the circle to do something. Maybe we want it to actually compute the area. So given that we know the radius, right, we should be able to compute the area of that circle. And so again, self always has to be there, but otherwise there's no, there's no arguments here. We don't need any more information to compute the, the, the area. I mean, remember, we know the radius internally, we're storing that. So we can now, well, the method says the area of the circle is, and we can print, well, it's here. Uh, that's no good. Um, the area is, um, we have math, right? We imported math times self radius squared, right? Area equals pi r squared, and we'll print that. Again, nothing happens when we run this. It's just a definition that's sitting there, but now we've built a class that actually has this area method we can call that, that does something. It takes that state we've already stored internally, the radius, and it produces something else with it. So we can now say c equals a circle with radius of 15, and now if we say, uh, well actually, let's, you know, sorry, now if we say c dot area, it will print that, that area for you. And this is how every object you see in Python is defined on some level. Now, the, the, the catch is that most of the, the, core, the core classes are actually written in C for speed, um, so they don't, not written in native Python code, but it's the same, same idea. The idea is that um, uh, even integers are defined basically in this way. There's like a chunk of code somewhere that explains exactly what an inter, integer can do. Yeah? So can you just like overwrite an object class? Like uh -huh. we're gonna take one and then uh -huh. you know, redefine as yes. a circle? 
that's, a, that's an excellent question. You cannot in Python, not without a lot of hacking. There are other languages, like, like Ruby will let you do this. And so one, one way to distinguish like a Ruby programmer from a Python programmer is just how they react. And you say, well, just like monkey patch the string class. In Ruby, you can take that built-in string class and start adding methods to it. Most Python programmers would be horrified by this because you're changing sort of core functionality in the language and you don't know what's going to happen if someone else inherits that code base. Um, so you can't do that with sort of built-in classes, but you can do that with classes like this. You could take my circle class and start adding stuff to it. Um, in fact, it's as easy as, um, and certainly after it's initialized, right, so you could, I mean, this is where Python is fairly flexible. You could just add new properties. You probably shouldn't get in the habit of doing this, but you could say, you know, area squared equals, um, and so now there's a new variable internally stored, right? So you don't mean, this may not, you kind of may not appreciate how weird this is if you're coming from like Java or C where you would never sort of access from the outside these internal variables. But you can't technically add anything you want to any object any time um, unless it's explicitly checking to make sure that you're not sort of adding weird stuff to it. Uh, I think it's actually, I'm not sure, let's see. Like if you just say A equals four, can you then say, no. Um, yeah, so. But that's because the integer class is guarding against that kind of thing. It's not, you know, it's not a, it, it, typically you'll be able to. Um, okay, so now we have, oh, so we have area. Um, let me skip over the initiative of time. I'll just skip over the other thing I was gonna do here is just make a method that creates a copy, but that's not particularly important. The thing I really wanted to get to, which is sort of a more advanced thing, and again, don't worry if it doesn't make sense. I just kind of want you to get a flavor of what's actually going on here. And like the, the Python has a really actually very elegant uh, data model internally. Uh, the thing I want to talk about is magic methods. So you already saw this for that init thing, right? That, that Python has all kinds of these sort of magic methods, they're called. They're functions uh, inside objects that have, that start with a double underscore and end with a double underscore. And so you have things like uh, init uh, and new, and their behavior is defined somewhere and it can be fairly complex. But the point I wanted to make, and this is because I just because I think it's cool, is that in Python, all operators, things like plus, greater than, et cetera, are actually cleverly disguised method calls. So remember, right, I, I mentioned that like somewhere someone has defined what an integer does when you say uh, age in years times two, that's actually translated, it's equivalent, literally the same thing as saying age in years and then calling a method on that, that integer class called underscore underscore mole underscore underscore two. Right? So these are equivalent, that's actually what's happening when you call this, it's first converted to this. And what that means is when you define a new class, you can actually say, you can have this be whatever you want. You can define that behavior to be anything you like. And any object that implements the mole method can then use the star operator. So let me just show you this real quick. So if we go back to our, if we go back to our circle class, uh, we are not going to implement this, this magic method. Well, let me show you this first. So if, if, if I, all right, so we have this class and if I create a new circle um, with radius four, and then I say, hey, multiply that by two, I get an error because it doesn't know anything about multiplication. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add the thing that actually in, in Python allows, it sort of the, defines the, 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 this multiplication operator. So we're going to say it can take one argument and it's another circle. Let's call it other, just so it's clear. And uh, what we can do is we can return a new a copy of a new circle with the radius uh, that's the multiply, we're multiplying the radius of the current circle and the one we just received. So. Let's say, just make it very explicit, new radius equals self radius times other radius. And then we'll return a new circle oops, that has that new radius, okay? So we are basically defining this, this, this multiplication operator. So now let's create two circles. We'll say one is small circle, has a radius of two. Our big circle has a radius of four. And now, if we do small circle times big circle, any guess of what we'll see? You probably shouldn't have good intuitions. You'll just see, like, it just describes the thing that came out of this, right? So let's, uh, let's call this even bigger circle because we're multiplying, right? So, and if I now want to, if I ask the question, what is the radius of this new circle? Actually, let's see the, its area, even better. What is the answer going to be? Well, you don't know because you'd have to do the math in your head, right? But hopefully you kind of get an idea of what's going on here. Right. And so this is, I think, kind of crazy, right? It's pretty cool. So we define this multiplication operator. We basically said that, hey, any circle object, when you call this, uh, when you try to multiply it by another thing, um, will invoke that function we wrote, and then it'll return a new circle with a new radius. 
So it, this really opens the door to doing all kinds of crazy things, hopefully not so crazy, but you can write, for example, very nice, what are called domain-specific languages. You can come up with very compact syntax. You can define new classes that have all kinds of be complex behavior that is controlled by mathematical operators, greater than, less than, right? And so this can actually be very powerful. Um, and there are lots of these other, uh, lots of different magic methods um, we could use. Uh, so that's an overview of the language, mostly showing you sort of very basic stuff, but also maybe giving you a flavor of some of the internal of the language. Um, I just want to switch gear and just wrap up. I'm really, I think like I've got through probably less than half of what I wanted to. Um, but just because I think many of you are coming from, from different uh, languages, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on um, talking about like why do data science in Python. Right? So you saw a little bit of the language. But what makes Python, I think, a particularly good language, and Ariel already talked a little bit about this. Um, uh, so I'll just talk, walk through some features. So one is it's easy to learn, relatively speaking. I mean, all programming is hard to learn. But as languages go, the syntax is readable and explicit. You've already seen this, hopefully. Uh, you have an indentation that forces you to structure your code in a fairly conventional way. Most packages are very well documented. This is not a property of the language, just the fact that most Python or many Python coders come from a, from a sort of computer science or software development background. So there's more of a respect, I think, for um, documenting uh, and testing code. Uh, for, if you want a good example of this, I would urge you to, many of you have probably seen already, the, the scikit-learn documentation. Uh, you, if not, don't worry, you'll learn all about scikit-learn uh, from Jake Vanderplas on Wednesday. Beautiful documentation. In fact, I usually send people there to learn about machine learning. People ask all the time, well, how do I learn machine learning? A good way to start is actually by going to the scikit-learn documentation. Um, lots of tutorials, guides, and other educational materials in Python, a huge community. Uh, I mentioned the standard library. So if you click on this link, it will take you to all the, all the modules that come with Python out of the box. There's a lot of them, right? So there's a good chance that the thing you need to do uh, is already implemented. And so when in doubt, you should check that standard library first. Don't just start writing your own thing. There's a good chance someone has done it. And probably it's been more efficiently uh, for you because a lot of the stuff in that library is written in C. Um, so if you need to do like move files around or delete files, you have the OS module, uh, regular expressions. If you don't know what regular expressions are, that's cool. I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about them at some point. Uh, someone will. Uh, collections have all kinds of useful data structures. I've already showed you one or two. Uh, Multiprocessing, so very simple, like very simple, but but nonetheless useful. Parallelization. If you have eight cores, you don't want to like deal with like um, distributing jobs into the cloud and so on. You can do very simple things very quickly with with uh, multiprocessing. Uh, you can serialize or store in binary form files on disk. You can read and write JSON and all and so on. I mean, these are just like a couple of hand-picked examples. Uh, but beyond that, Python also has really, really good, often best-in-class external packages for really almost anything. So, uh, and this is particularly important for data science, right? Because the, the toolkit we draw on is, is really quite broad. So, package management has become really quite easy with Con and Pip. I think it's still not as clean as, for example, R. I will give R that. Uh, but uh, it's gotten much better than it used to be. Um, some examples of, and so you can install almost everything you see in this list, I think everything actually, by just doing conda install or pip install, blah. Uh, some examples, if you're doing web development, right, something that's not super easy to do in other languages, you're not going to write like a, a serious uh, production web application in R or MATLAB, I'm guessing. But you can do it in Python. In fact, you have several choices for framework uh, to do it in. Um, you have a variety of database ORMs, so, so there's lots of tools that make it easier to interact with uh, databases, relational databases in Python. You can you have all kinds of tools for scraping and parsing uh, text. Uh, there's toolkits for natural language processing that are best in class. And of course, and we will spend you know, ample time on this in the next couple of days, uh, there's really, really, really good packages for numerical computing and data analysis. So we'll talk a lot about, I think JB Pauline is going to talk uh, tomorrow about NumPy. Uh, SciPy we might cover a little bit. I'll talk a lot about pandas. Uh, X-Array I won't talk about really, but it's sort of an extension of, of pandas. And um, as you probably know, I think it's safe to say that Python is probably by a health, fairly healthy margin the most widely used language for machine learning. And that's in large part because it has really fantastic packages like scikit-learn, TensorFlow, Keras. Many of these also have, other than scikit-learn, also have bindings in other languages. So you're not restricted to, to using these things in Python. But the interfaces, I think, are probably, they're initially written in Python. And I think they're, they, they fit the language most naturally in some sense. And people spend the most effort on them. Um, and so on. I'll talk a lot about visualization uh, either tomorrow or Wednesday. We're still hammering out the schedule. 
Um, so it's also an exceptional language for, uh, for, for visualization. There's lots and lots of stuff you can do uh, in Python. And lastly, probably not many of you will ever need to write a GUI in Python, but there are sort of bindings to all kinds of toolkits. So if you really wanted to build like a desktop application in Python, you could do it. Maybe not the best way to go, but you could do it and it would be fine. Um, and so on. Um, I'll skip over this, well, I'll, I'll breeze through this. So, so you might think of Python, given that I've described and given what you've heard, as a slow language because the idea is that high level dynamic languages tend to be slow, and I mentioned this already. Um, as I've said, I think already, like, this is arguably not really a constraint. For most of what we do, even when we're working with fairly large data sets, not all, but most of the time, performance is actually fairly irrelevant. Right? What you care about usually is how fast you're gonna write the code. Like, if you can write the code in a day instead of a week, you can let it run a little longer. That's probably better than spending you know, three weeks of your time to write code that's 10 times as fast if it still only takes like an hour. So in general, uh, I think you know, we, we tend to favor development time over execution time. That said, the less Python code you write yourself, the better your performance will be. Right? So again, like, look for libraries other people have written. They're probably highly optimized. Much of the standard library in Python consists of pi interfaces to C, and so it's actually fairly fast. You probably can't do better than it. Um, I'll just show you a really quick example. Here's, I'm creating a list of, of, uh, of, um, of, ten, of 100,000 integers, and the built-in function uh, sum in Python is just gonna sum up those numbers and takes 352 microseconds to do that, it's very fast. You might think, well, this is probably doing all kinds of other stuff. It's probably got like validation checks and internal overhead. I'm just gonna write a really super simple sum that expects everything is pristine, and so you just write a very naive thing, initialize zero, and then just loop over and increment that list. And then you time this, uh, I'll write my own sum, thank you thing that you wrote in native Python, and lo and behold, it's 10 times as slow, right? You cannot beat, you rarely can beat the, the standard library. And there's no reason to try. So if something is built in, you probably should use it. Um, now, I won't talk about this because our little talk, I'll just advertise for his talk. Uh, if you need more speed, there's all kinds of things you can do in Python. So there's Cython, which is basically like a limited subset of C that you can write it actually in Python. Uh, there's just in time compilation, which is really cool. I'll skip over all this stuff um, in the interest of time. Okay, so probably the last thing I'll, I'll talk about is, is, is compare Python with other languages. So obviously you have choices, right? You're sitting in this room, you're gonna hear about Mat R, MATLAB, maybe even Java, and you know, these, these things have, there are alternatives, R probably being the most obvious one. What are the pros and cons, or mostly pros, I would say, of Python? Um, well, if we compare it to R, R clearly is dominant in, in traditional statistics, and classical statistics, and also in some fields of science, although I think that's changing. Um, the main selling point for R, and I think this is undeniably still true, is just the support, right? I mean, if you're going to be doing classical statistics and you need, like, multiple imputation, you should probably stick with R. There's, like, I think, a multiple imputation package in Python. It's probably not nearly as rich as some of the stuff in R, and that's because the R community is primarily made up of, or not primarily, but largely made up of, of scientists and statisticians, people who are thinking not about software per se, but about the tools they want to use. So if you're doing classical statistics, and that's mostly what you're going to be doing, then I think there's actually no good reason for you to switch to, well, it's defensible to stay, it's completely defensible to keep working in R. Um, because that's really the use case it's designed for. It's really rapid, really rich data analysis. It tends to be slow, however, although many of the same optimizations have actually been built into R. Um, the thing that will drive people from sort of software development backgrounds crazy is the language is kind of horrific, right? It has all these quirks that just don't make any sense. Python is, and there are always quirks, but is a much more internally consistent, I think, well thought out uh, uh, programming language. And so um, it's much easier to build, I think, large code bases in Python than in R. And I know almost nobody who's actually switched from Python to R. I know plenty of people who've gone the other way. Um, and in general, R just has much less support for anything non-data related. So if you, like I said, if you want to, like, computational code that immediately pushes to a web server, or, like a backend, that's not actually hard at all to do in Python. Uh, it can be harder to do in R, although R does have, um, um, how, what do you call it? Um, web, web visualization thing. Shiny. shiny, yes, shiny, which Python does not have a good equivalent to. So it, it, to be fair, there are things that R does better, and shiny, I think, is one of them. MATLAB, I kind of don't even want to talk about, mainly because it's proprietary. Like, it's, there are nice things about MATLAB, but it, you know, it's fast, for example, but it is proprietary. And at the end of the day, this is a, you're setting a really high barrier for use when you write your code in MATLAB. 
And also the community is much, much smaller. So in the long run, there's just no way that MATLAB, you know, however many people MathWorks deploy, MathWorks cannot compete with the broad community of, of you know, hundreds of thousands of Python developers. Um, and it's already the case that most of what you can do in Python, you could not possibly do in, in MATLAB. So it's not really suitable for use as a general purpose language, I would say. So what I would, the way I would put this is that, you know, again, I'm not going to say like Python is the one true language. I gave you some cases where you probably would want to use other languages. But I would argue that none of these other languages, none of the other sort of data science choices available ha have the same combination of readability, flexibility, um, really comprehensive libraries, and good performance. And what you'll often hear people say, and I really like this, is, is Python is the second best language for everything, right? So sure, there are applications. Like you probably don't write like a video game engine in, in, in Python. It's probably not even the second best language for that, actually. It's a bad example. But the point is that you can find an acceptable solution in Python for almost anything you care to do. And that's a really big thing, because it's actually not, you know, it's not, it's not, it's really kind of annoying to switch between languages, right? So um, I used to do like, you know, Ruby for, for web development and, uh, R for statistics um, and Java for like uh, you know like desktop apps and it let's not talk about coffee screen. and you know you just it's really hard to maintain like five languages in mind and then have them interact nicely and it just becomes much much easier when you're just working with like one language uh, again I'm not saying you should always use Python but you know if you didn't know anything else um, it would be a good choice I think um, I will stop there in the interest of time I'm happy to talk about all the stuff I didn't get to. Uh, I didn't talk about Jupyter Notebook, but that's okay. Fernando will talk about it at length tomorrow. And the other thing is NumPy Arrays, which again, we'll have, I think, a whole hour and a half just to talk about. So um, I'll stop there. Um, are there any sort of burning questions people have, or quick questions? Um, no. Okay, well, I'm happy. I'll be around for the next two weeks. So, you know, please do come up to me and say, like, I don't understand this thing in Python. Can you walk me through? And I'll be happy to do that. And as I mentioned, I'll try to find a time we can do, like, sort of more in-depth tips and tricks as well for people who, who this stuff is sort of basic. Uh, all right, so I'll stop there. Thanks.